church. It's a great day to bless the name of Jesus. Amen. So come on, wherever you are, whether you're online or in the room, from the front to the back, come on, let's bless the name of Jesus. Come on, lift up your praise. Oh, thank you, Jesus. We bless you, God. I join with heaven above I'm giving you the highest praise Giving you the highest praise This is the day you made There's not a second to waste Jesus, I will bless your name Amen Jesus, I will bless your name In this house, we bless the name of God. And as we declare His name in this place, come on, from the front to the back, lift up your voice to Jesus, because He deserves our praise. Amen. Come on, church, clap your hands. Let's go. Do you see what I see? Do you see what I see? And I see lightning, I hear thunder. Something stirring six feet under. Dead things coming back to life 
again And I believe there's about to be another resurrection Come on, do you believe it? And I see signs and I see wonders And I see birds of living colors Dead things, dead things coming back to life again And I believe there's about to be another resurrection Come on church, let's sing together So come everybody my name is small welcome to church if you're watching online we are so glad that you're here it is a great day 
for us to reach out to our faithful God. I don't know how you came into church today, but here's what I know. God will meet us halfway right where we're at if we will reach out to Him. Amen. Quickly, we're going to turn into a time of worship and prayer. But I want to remind you, in the Bible, in Ephesians 2 verse 18, it talks about it is through Jesus that we both have a way of approach to the Father. In His name, we can approach our Father. By His sacrifice, we can approach the Father. There's a story in the Bible um, that talks about a woman with the issue of blood. It is, she's been sick for years and she was in the crowd and she knew Jesus was going to be there. And she did everything she could, even though she wasn't supposed to be there, she did everything she could so she could reach out to Jesus. And by her faith, she was healed. Jesus didn't come just to meet our needs. He came to respond to faith. All of us here, we have needs. That's not a question. Each one of us, we have needs. But it's, here's the question. Do we have faith to reach out to God? Do we have faith to actually step out of our comfort zone and say, God, I need you. I need you to come through. Ask for prayer for somebody. So right now, all across the auditorium, on the middle section, on the sides and on the front, we'd like to invite you to come forward for prayer. I'd like to invite to come forward to ask for prayer. There is so much power when we come forward and we ask people to pray for us, pray with us, because we serve a God who responds to faith. We serve a God who doesn't just respond to our needs, He responds to our faith. And so if that's you, I believe there's someone here you need direction. There's someone here you need provision. There's someone here you're praying for a job opportunity. There's someone here and you're believing for healing. If you're believing for supernatural healing, on this side we'll anoint you with oil just like what it says in the book of James. And we will pray for you and we believe that you will be healed like the hundreds of people that have already been healed in this altar right now. So come on, if that is you, you can begin to come forward. You can begin to walk to the sides or in the middle section. And you can begin to ask for prayer and we would love to pray with you and pray for you. Don't wait for the song to start. You can start walking right now so that you could begin to reach out to God in faith that He will respond to you in this moment. For the rest of us, come on. Can we respond with faith to God? Can we reach out to the heavens right now? Can we surrender to God? Could we lift our hands as a sign of surrender all across the room from the front to the back? Could we lift up our hands to God right now? And could we begin to pray, Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we long to, uh, to see you, God. We long to see you face to face, Lord, in the next few moments, God, as we enter into a time of worship, God. I pray that we would lift your name up. I would pray that we would lift your name, exalt your name, God. You deserve not half of our worship, but all of our worship, God. You deserve the praise, the honor. We thank you that you're going to meet us right where we're at. But in this moment, God, we reach out in faith, Lord, that you will respond. You will respond to our cries. Oh, we love you. We worship you in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said, Amen, Amen. If that's you, you need prayer, come forward. Come to the sides and we'll pray with you and we'll pray for you. Because of Christ, 
to God. We surrender to you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, for everything you've done. I am 
lift our voices to God and say, May I never boast in anything except the cross of Jesus Christ. May I not forget the bloody shed. It is by His death I am alive. This is why. Because of Christ, I am alive. Come on, church, if you're free today. There's a resurrection power in the name of Jesus. If you're free, shout hallelujah, hallelujah. If you're free, shout hallelujah. If you're free, shout hallelujah. 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 If you're free, shout hallelujah. 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 If you're free, shout hallelujah. 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 Death no more. Sing no more. God praise, give God praise. Let me hear church, come on. Lift your voice to God, give him, give him praise. Give him praise in this place. Everyone sing. May I never boast in anything except the cross.
come on, let's declare this. The cross still stands, the blood still flows, the work is finished, and hell still knows that the grave is still empty, the stone is still rolled, and you're still high and lifted up. You're still Yeah. 
here in this room. I don't know if you feel it too, but even ever since this morning, I've felt His presence. And I even just picture Him, you know, just moving and like approaching. And I just get the sense in my spirit that He's here. He's here for you. To the person who's grieving, He's here for you. To the person who's lonely in need, in need of hope, He's here for you. To the person who is in needing of healing, He's here for you. So I don't know what you're going through, but Hosanna means God save us. He's here to save you. He has not only saved us 2,000 years ago in the cross, He is currently still saving. He's still saving. He's alive. He's still here. So I don't know what you need Him to come through in your life, maybe in your finances, maybe in your, in your family, maybe in your relationship, maybe in your work, maybe in your physical body, maybe in your mental health. But can you lift your voice and reach out to Him and tell Him, Hosanna, God, I need you. Hosanna, God, I need you. Would you come? Would you come and fill me? Would you come and show up in my need? Would you come and show up? Because I need you. And I need you. And some of us here, again, some of us need to have a revelation of who God is. Because He's not, he's not only healing, He's a healer. He's not only providing, He's a provider. Everything that He's doing comes out of His character. Everything that He's doing, He's not just doing it because He wants to. That's who He is. That's who He is. That's why He's saving. Because He's a Savior. That's why He's providing for you. He's because He's a provider. And I don't know about you, but He, he doesn't only give us peace. He is peace. He doesn't just give you joy. He is joy. So some of you need to get a revelation of the character of Jesus, that He's your Savior, that He's your Lord, that He's there for you, that He's your friend, that He's a provider, that He's a healer, that He's, he's, your, your, he's your lover, that He is peace, He is almighty. The Bible says that unto us a child is born and the government shall be on His shoulders and we shall call Him Wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace, Mighty God, Everlasting. Father, that is the God that we serve right now. And He is here in this room. So I don't know about you, but my faith is stirred up to believe that whatever I need today, God is going to come through in my life because He loves me. Because that's who He is. That's who He is. And it doesn't matter what you're feeling. Can you just give Him praise right now? Can you give Him praise? Because He deserves all the praise, all the honor, all the glory. God, we love you. We are. We thank you, we thank you that you are here, that you are alive, and that you are near. God, we praise you, we praise you, we praise you in this place. Come on, let's show your praise. Oh God, we love you. God, we love you. We love you, Lord. God, I pray that today people will have an a genuine encounter with you. Not just a, a good experience in church, but God, I pray that we have an encounter with Jesus, the Savior, 
and there, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You can go ahead and take your seats. And we're going to continue worshiping through our tithes and our offerings. You know, in our church, we give out of conviction and compulsion. And it says in His Word that you, you have to give what you have decided in your heart to give because God loves a cheerful giver. So if you've already given or you're about to give, may it be out of a, an overflow, not because you felt, feel compelled to give. But if you've already given, can you join me? Or if you're about to give, join me in praying. God, we thank you. We thank you that everything we need and everything we have comes from you. God, we're only just giving back what's already yours. So Lord, I pray for every person giving. God, that they will give out of a cheerful heart. Not forced, but God, out of that conviction, Father. So Lord, would you bless every giver today and may you bless everything that's been given so that more people will come to know you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome to church. Everyone in the room, can I get a shout? Woo! And to those online, welcome. If you haven't met yet, my name is Don, and I'm part of the team here at Favor. And every week, I know we get a lot of new people. And as part of our, our culture in our church, we love people. And we love welcoming every people who have come here for the very first time. So all across the ballroom, we'd see people who are going to stand up right now. And they're carrying in their hands a little cute white bag. Because we'd love to give this to you as our way of saying thank you for coming along to church. And in those bags are some, I think, candies, but more importantly, information about our church and as well as a black card that we'll see. In, you'll see when you pick it up, but we want you to fill this out because we'd love to get to know you because you're not just a person, but you, we want to get to know you and we want to get you plugged into community. So if that's you, if you've come here or you're that friend who brought that someone along, can you lift up your hands? because we'd love to know who you are. And church, can we give them a warm welcome? Lift your hands right now. One, two, three. Welcome, everyone. We see a lot of people in the back, on the sides, on the left, in the middle. There you go. Welcome, everyone. We'll see hands there. Still at the back. Just keep on waving. We'll see you. We'll see you. We'll get to you. I love the enthusiasm. She stood up and waved her hands. That's what we want. So thank you. Can we give a hand again to every person who has come here for the very first time? I think we still have more. Don't be shy. Just keep it up. But if you got those bags, again, as I told earlier, there's a black card there. And you'll see at the back, there's some info. There's some blanks that we would love for you to fill out. And after the service, we would love to meet you outside at our foyer because we'd love to get to know if this is the church for you, if there's nothing. But more than that, if you're in a hurry, you can just drop them off at any of our boxes. So that we'll make sure that we'll get to contact you this week. Is that good? All right. And again, the next step naturally for that if you're new people is there's so many communities that you can get plugged into church. But also one of the main things that we do is connect groups. So who here is a part of connect group? Woo! Awesome. Those who are not part of the connect group, you can sign up for one. You can see it in our favorite church slash Manila News later on. But for those who are in connect this April 6th, we actually have a social connect happening at Valle Verde 5. This is not forced, but it is our way of helping you because I know it's hard to think of fun ideas for social connect. So we're doing it for you. So if you don't have anything planned, we're actually gathering all our connect groups in one place for you to chill, for you to eat, just eat maybe, help games. No competition at all for all the competitive people. It's all just fun and games. So if you're part of a connect group and I'd love to join that, go to favorite.church slash fun day all right awesome here in our church we are a friendly church so quickly quickly everyone can you stand up on your feet and it take one minute for you to meet somebody new not the friend you've arrived in church and we'll get back in a minute
right, that was quick. Everyone, can you all settle down? Settle down, settle down. Because in just a bit, Pastor James is gonna come up. Gonna show us his new hair for those who missed that post. He's gonna show us his gray hair. But before that, there's actually something very special happening this Thursday. And it's our senior pastor, Pastor James's 40th birthday. But I'm sure you already know that you've been here in our church for long because he's been mentioning it. But we really want to honor your Pastor James. And as a way of honoring you, we have something special for you. So if you can please go up there in front. And everyone, let's fix our eyes on the screen. Pastor James's EA, this is how he used to call me. Tally! Tally! Because <laughs> I was just on the other wall, the other side. Tally! <laughs> no, just kidding. My favorite memory of Pastor James is when he talked about loving people and loving God. But you can't love God and not love people. So, sakta in timing, because that time I was kind of losing hope from people. But then he actually ministered to my heart, and I'll never forget it. I am grateful for your. The times he went to me in BGC when I still really hated church. <laughs> I think he went to me three times on his motorbike. He came three times. We had sandwiches in Wildflower always. I thought that was really special. It just that me kept coming back. It's hard to pinpoint one, but I, I'd say the Astoria days when we'd go there every Sunday or within the week and just pray for favor, um, pray for our, our children, our soon to have children back then, and uh, just spending time with Kate and James, playing celebrities, um, clicking the Mac for words. So, so for me, it's, it's also in the Astoria days because um, it was the longest prayer that I have ever prayed. I always say this to maybe many engagements that we've had, but I've always asked, I've always told James that that was probably the longest prayer. And those are the 11 prayer points. And I loved it. I love that memory because he had so much faith and I had so little. And today, Every time that prayer is being answered, constantly being answered, I just became so, I continue to become in awe of, of what God has done. Favorite memory with Pastor James was when we had around 50 people in our church. He spoke vision into my life and just uh, saw the bigness of the call of God on my life that I couldn't even see at all until now I'm struggling to see it. Um, but he just believes in people so much and I was so impacted by that one conversation uh, that changed my life. What I love about Pastor James, I love his authenticity, I love his heart for people, and him being a spiritual father to every one of us. I love that he is hes super intentional, he's super kind, and he just brings out the best in me and the rest of us in the church. One of my favorite memories with Pastor James is actually him going and preaching to our bar exams the day before and I was still new then in church and he um, went there wholeheartedly well wow, and preached a great message to us even if he didn't know me that well so I'm very grateful for that. One of the things I'm most thankful for about Pastor James is his belief and faith in people like me. He was able to see things and believe things that I didn't even see and I know a lot of other people have those types of stories so it really just shows the kind of person that he is. He's very loving and very trusting. Pastor James, thank you for saying yes, um, coming here in the Philippines, for saying yes to the call. Um, if it's not because of you and Pastor Kate, you're going to be having favorite church who loves to impact the generation and even me, myself. I have grown um, so much because of your guidance, because of your wisdom, because of your leadership. Happy, happy birthday, Pastor James. Thank you for loving on this church. Thank you for loving on our family. Thank you for loving and loving. Mwah. Good to see you. Welcome to church. I gotta say it without crying. Pastor James, I'd really like to thank you for investing so much in me. Um, you've really shown me the grace of God. You've invested, you've seen things, you've You've seen gold in me even before I saw it in myself. And so thank you for all the sacrifices you've made for me, everybody in this church, and you've really impacted my life and 
future generations in the Sadwani family to come. Thank you. Love you. Happy birthday, James. I just want to thank you for being you, for always being there for us. No matter what time of the day, no matter how busy you are, and no matter how much our church have grown, just thank you so much for being, for being a great friend and a great pastor. Pastor James, uh, you know that we love you so much. Thank you for taking a chance on me and John, and we will be forever grateful. Thank you for your patience, for how you've modeled uh, leadership and uh, being a father and loving with such intentionality. Like, you are the real deal. You walk your talk 100%. And so we just want to thank you. Thank you for the authenticity. Thank you for how generous you've been so much to our family. And uh, Wolfie benefits from it. Me and John benefit from it. And we just love you so much. Happy 40th birthday. Well, happy birthday, Pastor James. I love you very much. I hope you love the silver hair because we all love it. Happy birthday, Pastor James. Thank you for being a great father to your family and to our church. Happy birthday, Pastor James. 40 is the new 20. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday Pastor, Pastor James. James. Thank you for being my white father and allowing me to pick your brain. Happy birthday, Pastor James. All the love. Happy birthday, Pastor James. Happy birthday, Pastor James. Happy birthday. Happy 40th. Hi, Pastor James from your favorite family on your 40th. We wish you a... Come on, can we sing happy birthday? Birthday to you, happy birthday. <laughs> happy birthday, happy birthday. We love you, babe. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Love you. Thank you, everyone, for being here for his mini uh, birthday party. <laughs> there is not enough cake for all of you. I'm just saying that now. <laughs> but we love you so much. Um, they said it best, but I just wanted to share three things uh, that I really, really love about you and honour about you. And I wrote it down so I won't go this way, but I'll stay on track. Cece, our second daughter, is at home right now. She's not feeling well, so hi Cece. But our other two are here. Uh, three things I just wanna honour you today on, well, on your birthday, almost birthday. <laughs> I wanna honour in front of everyone, I wanna honour your love for Jesus. I love, uh, the love for Jesus, your love for Jesus has grown over the years, despite whatever situation you're facing. And you inspire me to love Him more, to, to serve Him cheerfully. And you are intentional in your growth with Him. You're consistent in your Bible reading. You're consistent in your prayer life. And um, you're just intentional and consistent. I want to honour that. The second thing is I want to honour your heart for the people in this house, for all of us. <laughs> uh, you believe in us. You cheer us on. You pray for us. Um, and that just means the world. You see who we can become in Christ, not who we are right now. You are kind and you're compassionate to all of us. I'm sure you all would agree. If this is your first time at church, welcome. <laughs> this is just a family moment, okay? The third thing, I just wanna honour your integrity and your faithfulness. You really are the same man on and off the platform. You don't change. <laughs> You are just as authentic, uh, you are authentic, and what you see is what you get with you, whether it's in front of hundreds or thousands, or it's just me in our bedroom, you're the same person, same sense of humour, I tell you, same passion in your voice for the things of God, it's the same zeal for the local church, you have that same zeal, you are a man of integrity, and you are a man who is faithful to the Lord, and a man that has allowed the Lord to, to build His church through you. And so we are blessed. We are blessed that you are our pastor and that you're our leader. Um, I'm blessed. I'm very, very blessed that you are my husband. 
And our kids are blessed that you're their dad. And I just wanna finish by speaking um, the blessing and prayer from Numbers 6 over your life, verses 24 to 26. It says, the Lord bless you and keep you, protect you, sustain you and guard you. The Lord make His face shine upon you with favour and be gracious to you, surrounding you with loving kindness. The Lord lift up His countenance, His face upon you with divine approval and give you a peace, a tranquil heart and life. Happy birthday. We love you so much. We're so grateful for you. And we're believing the next 40 will be even better than this 40. Amen. Church, is it okay if we pray for him right now? I've asked Pastor Paul to pray for him. We're just going to pray a, a prayer of blessing. Could you stretch out your hands? Let's pray for Pastor James. Lord, thank you. Thank you, God, for sending us a healthy spiritual father for this house, Lord God. Thank you for sending him to us. We're very blessed, God. We thank you that you sent him to take care of, our, take care of many of our father issues. But thank you, God, that you're going to bless him, bless him indeed. I thank you that in the next decade to come, he's going to see more of your move, oh God, your faithfulness and your favor in his family, in his ministry, in his own personal life. I think that what he's about to reap will be greater than what has already reaped in the past four decades, God. I thank you, Lord, for a new season. Thank you, God, that you're going to bring him more wisdom and more favor. Thank you, God, in, in all his businesses, investments, you're going to bring your favor. You're going to provide for him because you've seen his heart to bless others, God. I thank you, Lord, for all that you're about to do. Thank you, God, for sending him to us. We are all blessed to be a, a blessing because of what he sacrificed. God, we thank you for all the marriages that has happened, that has been restored, the families that has been restored, God, because of his leadership, God, because of what you've done through his life, Lord. So we just pray, God, a new mantle of anointing and blessing over his life. We thank you, Lord, you're going to bless him. And we thank you that hundreds and even thousands of churches in the Philippines will be be blessed because of what you're about to do in his life. And we thank you, Lord, that you're going to raise the price of Bitcoin in Jesus' name. And you're going to raise it to $1 million, Lord. And you're going to bless his family. Bless him, God. We thank you for him and we praise you for his life. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone shout it. Amen. Amen. Come on, one more time. Can we greet Pastor James? Hey, happy birthday. Love you, Pastor James. Thank you, church, for participating in that. Why don't we check out this week's edition of Favor News. Hey, Favor fam. Welcome to this week's edition of Favor News. For all the info and announcements I'm about to mention, visit favor.church slash manila news. Ready? Let's go. We have a multi-generational church and a vibrant season community. If you are 50 years old and above, join us at our Zizan Community Gathering happening on April 12th. Don't miss this chance to meet new people, share good food, and have great conversations. RSVP to let us know if you can make it. We've got Freedom Encounter happening in the next few weeks. So prepare for a full morning of in-depth teaching and powerful prayer sessions, all aimed at helping you break free from whatever's been holding you back from experiencing complete freedom in Christ. If you're interested and can commit to attending, don't forget to register. This event is totally free. Before Forever Batch is happening on Saturdays, April 13 and 20. Before Forever is our premarital counseling course where you get to attend sessions with other soon-to-be-married couples and meet with our counselors. The goal of this course is to help you prepare for forever with your future spouse. And it's a prerequisite for weddings that will be officiated by Favorite Church. 
So if you're getting married or planning to get married, sign up as early as now because we have some pre-work you will need to complete before you begin. Register over here. Make sure not to miss out on Favor Conference 2024. We have a lot of exciting things planned, special guests, fun family moments, awesome merch, and we know that God is going to move. It's the last week to grab early bird tickets, fam, so don't wait for slots to run out. See you there. Here at Favor, we love celebrating one another's milestones because we are one big family. So a big congratulations to Dan and Liz, Jay and Ara, who just got married. Also to Don and Sam, who just got engaged. And Caleb and Rachel, who just gave birth to baby girl Ruthie. We love you guys. There's so many exciting things happening in the life of our church, so all the links you need from today's announcements are at favor.church slash manila news. Or you can drop by our info booth at the foyer after our service to ask any questions, share a testimony, or volunteer for a team. Next week, tell your seatmate, see you at Metro Tent, 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. services only to celebrate Easter Sunday. Stay updated by visiting our website or by following our social media channels popping up on your screen right now. And that is it for Favorite News. Wonderful. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, uh, thank you for that very sweet and uh, wonderful and unnecessary surprise. I, uh, uh, there's not a lot that goes on that I don't know, but I didn't know that was happening, so thank you. You know, it's really the greatest honor other than following Jesus I have in my life is being a husband and being a father and closely followed by pastoring this church. And so I just want to thank you. Thank you all for being on this journey with us. God really has been very kind to us. As a church, he's been kind to me. And so, yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited to turn 40. My best days are ahead. I dyed my hair uh, just for one last hurrah before I was 40. And, but I kind of like it. it uh, my wife likes it, and that's what matters. And so I might keep it. Uh, and uh, so we'll see how it goes. I just want to, but thank you. That was very, very kind. Thank you for all the, the uh, affirmation and the white father remarks. And uh, uh, it's just good to be in church. Uh, but before I preach, Mao just mentioned it, but I got to just really make it clear. Next week is Easter Sunday, but we are not here. Everybody say, we are not here. We're going to be having a pre-taste of conference and going to the Metro Tent. Uh, our lovely friends at Crown Plaza, uh, we booked the whole year, but evidently that didn't include Easter Sunday and, uh, and a couple other Sundays, so thank you, Crown Plaza. Come on, can we pray for our own building in Jesus' name? Crown Plaza's been good to us, but sometimes they kick us out, and uh, it's a little unfortunate with the size of our church. So we're going to be at Metro 10, and there's only going to be two services because it's a bigger venue. We can have two services in the morning, 10 a.m., 4 p.m. We're going to be baptizing people. If you've never been baptized before, sign up to get baptized. It's going to be a wonderful service. We're going to have kids' church there. We're getting other tents for kids' church, and it'll be a great trial run for conference, which is coming up. Sign up for conference. You will regret it if you don't. Amen? Amen. All right, let's preach. Uh, today is Palm Sunday. If you grew up in church, today was the day where we literally got palm leaves and used to do this. Anybody remember those old days? Pastor Rocky's old pastor used to ride into their church on a big white horse, which is, that's just the shallow depths of the issues he had in his church as his pastor acted like Jesus. And so... Today, I wanted to preach about Palm Sunday because to me, it's such an interesting and unique story. Let's read it in Matthew chapter 21. It says this in verse one, as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethhage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her, untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. And this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. 
The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed, and they brought the donkey and the colt and placed the cloaks on them for Jesus to sit. And a very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches, the palm tree, from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name. Come on, did anyone grow up in church and we used to sing a song, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. All right, obviously I'm the only one that grew up in church. (laughs) Comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. And when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus. This is a key, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Jesus entered the temple courts and he drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were in Dignant, which means they were really angry. The title of my message today is this. Is he Messiah or convenient? Is he Messiah or is he convenient? Ha- have you ever bought something and you were expecting one thing and what turned up was totally different, right? Like the internet now. Like have you ever, has anyone here ever gone online dating and you showed up expecting one thing and you got something else, right? Has anyone bought anything online? Come on, Shopee, Lazada, you bought something and it turned up and it was just totally different than what you were expecting. Do you remember that feeling that you had? There's a young couple in our church, uh, Kim and Josh, and Kim is on our staff, actually she's in our uh, youth and young adults department. And just last year, they got married. It was a wonderful wedding. I got to perform this beautiful wedding. And in excitement of them getting married and moving in together, they began to dream. How could we furnish our new place of living that we will live together? And they're great. They're wonderful, wonderful leaders in our church. And they were praying. They wanted, they wanted to buy like a sofa, a, a lounge suite where people could come and and they could disciple them and love them and share the gospel with them, maybe even sleep over at night if they had nowhere to sleep. You know, they really pray. They said, God, would you use our, our, would you use our, our sofa, our lounge to touch and reach people? And so Kim found this wonderful lounge online. Let's look at it. Kim, Kim found, wow, doesn't that look beautiful? Kim saw this lounge. She didn't just see a lounge. She she saw healed lives. She saw tears flowing from from the many people that could fit on this large couch that would come in and that fateful day came where the delivery came. They were so excited. Kim, newly married, so excited. Her man, her husband with her. They stood beside each other as this brand, this brand new tool of evangelism and pastoral care was delivered to their house. And with great expectation, they opened the door. And this is what they found. To be fair, they've been able to minister to one person at a time, because that's all that fits. Have you, have you ever bought something, and something turns up, and it's like that, and you're like, what? This, honestly, this is actually what I thought happened with the Israelites. They thought they were getting something, but really, they got something else when it came to Jesus. When I was younger, I, if I was honest, I could never really get my head around this story. I couldn't really comprehend how Jesus could go from hero to villain in one week. This weekend, we celebrate him as king. Next week, we put him on a cross and we kill him. I've never fully understood it, but as I've grown older, the dramatic turn of events that occurred within this next week that we're celebrating 
It's become a lot more real and understandable to me. And I think it has to do with how people saw Jesus, what they were expecting from Jesus, and their response when their expectation didn't match the reality that was before them. Let's set the context of this story so we can truly understand it. The Israelites, the the Jews, they were waiting for a Messiah, and there'd been prophecies about this Messiah, the coming king. And over time, they had created an image of what the Messiah would look like. And unfortunately, I believe the image that they created was more of a result of their cultural surroundings than it was a biblical picture of the prophetic words given. And this is maybe a little bit hard for us to understand because we sit here 2,000 years later and we know the story. We, un- we read the book, like we get, if you're in the Philippines, you get the story, right? He died, he rose again, his mother is 100 meters away on the corner of Edsa, right? Like we get the story of Jesus, but you have to understand, we gotta read this through the eyes of the Jews that were there. They had a few prophecies, but to your normal average Jew, maybe those prophecies were a bit vague. They had been taken over by Rome and and they'd been subjected to the rulership of Caesar, and they are looking for a Messiah. They're looking for a warrior king in the mold of their greatest king, David, who in fact the Messiah would come from that very house, the house of David, and this warrior king would come and free them from the shackles of their oppressors and the rule of their nation. This was their hope, and it was their dream. And Jesus comes and he rides in on a donkey. Matthew acknowledges that this is fulfilling a prophecy given in the book of Zechariah. And the people begin to put palm branches. That's why it's called Palm Sunday. Cut big branches, palm, put it on. And not just that, but in Matthew's version of this, they put coats on the ground. And these coats were a sign that royalty was coming. They would lay their coats down so that royalty wouldn't have to stand on the dirty ground, but they could stand on their coats. Maybe some of them wished that Jesus would come in like Rocky's old pastor on a big white horse. But alas, he came in on a little donkey. You know, in traditional Judaism, they never believed that the Messiah would actually be divine. They never believed that the Messiah would actually be God walking amongst them. They believed that the Messiah would be this warrior political leader that would save and they would lead the nation, even though there was prophecies. Isaiah 9 verse 6, we always say this at Christmas time, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given. This is a prophetic word about Jesus and the government will be on his shoulders Okay, so he's a leader. So they're thinking, okay, political leader. But it's like they just missed the next bit. And he'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I mean, it's right there in the name. How could they miss it? Just because it's written doesn't mean the revelation had said it. Jesus had told his disciples, I'm going to die and I'm going to rise again. And they were still shocked when it actually happened. Just because you read it or just because you hear it doesn't mean you fully get it until revelation comes in. I mean, Isaiah 53 described in detail how Jesus was going to be crucified, and people still didn't get it. This is what I believe. I believe that oppression had blinded the Jews to create a savior that they wanted rather than a savior that they needed. Which leads me to my one and only point today. I've got two sub points, but I've got one main point for today, and it's this. We are created in the image of God. He is not created in our image. The Jews were not looking for God. They were looking for an earthly savior. They were wanting an earthly king, someone to rescue them from Roman occupation instead of this earthly king warrior, they had a man who allowed himself to be arrested, that didn't fight back, that was quiet when accusations were coming against him, that was humble, and he even claimed to be God. And boy, did they turn quickly. Within a week, he went from hero to villain. When they realized that Jesus wasn't who they had created him to be with their minds, they crucified him. Now, Let's bring this into today's context because we can't crucify Jesus anymore. It happened. 
It already happened. It happened once. That's it. We don't crucify Jesus physically, but I think we kind of crucify Jesus metaphorically today. There's two generally negative responses that people have when it comes to responding to Jesus. This is it. The first one is this, is that people get angry and walk away from Jesus when he doesn't turn out to be who they think he is. Or secondly, they respond by creating their own version of Jesus and making him in our image. These are my two sub points. Let's go with the first one. It's this. We get angry and walk away from Jesus when he doesn't turn out to be who we think he is. 2,000 years ago, it was hurrah, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, son of David. Here comes the warrior king to save us. And he failed them. Now, 2,000 years later, this is what we do. Hosanna, blessed is Jesus to come and do something for me that someone has promised that he would do for me even though it's not really founded in any biblical truths. And when he doesn't do it, we have the same response. And we turn away. And this always ends up coming back to bad interpretation of scripture, either by us or by someone that's teaching us the Bible. Let's look at just a little example. Psalm chapter 37, verse four, I love this. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Isn't that a wonderful biblical truth? So everyone today, just delight yourself in the Lord, and he's going to give you anything you want. Isn't that wonderful? The desires. Isn't that great? You're all quiet. Good. You know your Bible, because you know that's not the context of that. Because if you read the whole Bible, you understand that Jesus is not Santa Claus, That you don't just delight, oh, I love Jesus. Now can I have this car? Can I have this spouse? Can I have this job promotion? Can I have this wife? Can I have this sofa? (laughs) So what inevitably will happen is the things that you desire in your heart probably aren't going to happen or they don't happen the way that we thought. And this is where we begin to get angry at Jesus said, if I delight in you, well, Jesus never said it. The psalmist said it. If I delight in you, then I'm going to get the desires of my heart. Well, this is a bad interpretation of scripture. You can't just cherry pick this little verse and go, well, this is what it is. You got to go through the whole Bible. I love second Corinthians chapter five, 17. It talks about how I am a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Literally the old has died. So, you know, when I become a Christian, my old heart dies and I get a new heart. Ezekiel even prophesies this, where God is going to take your heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh. And when that new heart that you have in Jesus, it will begin to beat in line with the desires that God has. And then we get to 1 John 5, 14, where it tells us that when we ask anything according to his will, he will hear it and he will give it to us. So instantly we can see that we don't just delight in the Lord and he gives us anything. We become a new creation. Our old heart goes, our new heart comes. And as we get a new heart, our heart will begin to beat and reflect God and his desire will become our desire, which then we go all the way back to Psalm because if we delight in the Lord, his desire will become our desires and he will give us the desires of our heart because they are ultimately his desire for us. That is great scripture explanation. So many times we get the wrong thing. Hey, you name it, you claim it, God's going to give it to you. God's going to give you what we want. And we read the Bible wrong and we get angry when Jesus doesn't match the expectation that we have on him. And this is where sovereignty and trust in God has to come in. Faith in God requires us to trust him. And trusting in God means, it means we have to not lean on our own understanding. And there will be many, I want to just speak this over you. There will be many things that happen in your life with your relationship with God that you will not fully understand and it will require trust. Do I trust that he is who he says he is? Either he's Lord of everything or Jesus is an absolute nutcase. Jesus cannot be just a good man. He can't be not the son of God, but a good man. He can't. 
Because if he's not the son of God, he's a raving lunatic that is claiming to be God. You can't. Like Jesus is either a crazy person or he is the son of God. And there will be things in life that we don't understand. And that's where we have to trust. Is he who he says he is? Do I trust in the sovereignty of God that even though I may not understand what's going on, I still trust in him and who he says he is? It's hard. Uh, Hard times in your life will test you whether or not you trust in the sovereignty of God or whether you've just created your own Jesus. The last eight and a half years, up until uh, last year, uh, Kate and I had walked a journey with Kate's mother, and we've spoken into this a, a couple times, but we walked a journey with Kate's mother who was diagnosed with a terrible, terrible disease called early onset dementia, where in the middle of her 50s, she started losing her thoughts, losing her memories, In the last two, three years, she didn't even recognize her own husband or her own children. And we prayed and we fasted. Kate prayed, Kate fasted, and Kate would have moments where she would be like, God is why? Why is this happening to us? Kate would pray for people in church and they would get healed. And she would go home and her mother was still dying. Like, that's tough. It's in those moments where you really get tested. In those moments where, well, Jesus, you said you're going to heal. How come you're not healing? Jesus, you're not healing. You have these moments in your life where you're really testing. And she would have some moments, and we were talking about this this weekend, and she said she would call her dad. She'd be like, Dad, why 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 isn't God doing anything? And her father would respond with this. He's a great man of faith, and he would say, well, Kate, we just have to trust in the sovereignty of God. Doesn't mean we're going to understand everything. It means that some things might happen that we don't get. You might look at it and go, well, did did God make her sick? No, I don't think that's in God's nature in the Bible. But why didn't God heal her? Well, I don't know. That's the mystery box. And if I understood everything about God, he would cease to be God. There are some things I just don't get. For people who have false expectations of who Jesus is, it's usually exposed in disappointment. In fact, this is generally the journey that people take from being in a relationship with Jesus to then deconstructing their faith and no longer walking with Jesus. This whole deconstructing their faith thing, this has become super sexy and popular recently. If you have TikTok or YouTube, you you will find many people on there deconstructing their faith and telling you everything wrong with what the majority of people have believed for 2,000 years in Christian history. But all of a sudden, in 2024, apparently we have new information. And so uh, this whole thing of deconstructing your faith, this is usually how the journey goes for someone who deconstructs their faith. They, they start with, wow, I love God. I believe in God. Now, the question is, well, what God do you believe in? Because then what begins to happen is, If you believe in God, but it's this God, and then all of a sudden you read scripture or you hear verses preached from a preacher, this subtle change comes in and goes, well, the God I believe in wouldn't do that. And this little subtle changes, and instantly when you make this little subtle change, it it changes from really accepting the God of the Bible to now, well, I like aspects of the God of the Bible, but there's some aspects I don't like, so I'm going to keep it over here, and I'm just going to create this own thing. And then some people will go even farther, and they won't just mix it. They'll then move to this phrase, which is, well, the, I could never believe in a God who would. I could never believe in a God that would send people to hell. Well, you're wrong. God doesn't send people to hell. People choose to go to hell when they reject him. I could never believe in a God that allows sickness, that has sickness in the earth. And it's because we've created this false, weird God that doesn't look anything like the Bible. It basically just looks like a big Santa Claus that makes us feel better about ourselves, which kind of leads me to my second point, which is this. We create our own version of Jesus. We make him in our image. We end up creating Jesus in our image when the whole time we were supposed to be created in his image. 
If we don't fully walk away from Jesus, we'll create a Jesus who minimizes sin, a Jesus who doesn't take judgment seriously, a Jesus who never punishes, a Jesus who loves everyone and accepts everyone and agrees with everyone. Massive difference between acceptance and agreement. Jesus accepts everyone. He doesn't agree with everyone. Jesus loves everyone. It doesn't mean that he agrees with what people do. You know what we've ended up doing is we've ended up creating an idol. And here's the crazy thing. We've created an idol, but we've put the name of Jesus on the idol. So we're actually not worshiping Jesus of the Bible. We're worshiping an idol Jesus that we've created. And idolatry has been around for a long time. An idol essentially is a false god. A god is anything that you can worship. Uh, an idol can be your money. It can be your family, your career. It can be the love team, your favorite love team. Anything that you worship in the Old Testament, we were told clearly in the Ten Commandments to not have any idols. And, and those were physical idols, wooden carved out idols the Israelites, when Moses went up to receive the Ten Commandments, formed an idol, this cow out of gold. There was physical idols. And here now in our modern day and age, well, in the Philippines, we do still have a lot of physical idols that people have in their houses. But a lot of times, particularly in our Christian church and with a lot of Christians, we may not have a physical idol, but we have idols that have captured our hearts. And we've made these idols, we've made false gods, but we've put the name of Jesus over it and we worship it. Do you know that it's easier for the devil to get church attendees to fall into idolatry than to get them to become atheists? Let, let me explain that. Do you know how hard it is to be an atheist? I have the utmost respect for atheists. Unbelievable. To, to, do you know the faith that it requires to believe that there is nothing. No, 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 seriously, like the, fa I actually, some people are like, oh, you don't like atheists. I love atheists. I wish I had their faith in my God the way they have their faith in nothing. Could you imagine if we all had the same faith that atheists had for our God? They, they believe in, it's, it's a lot easier to believe in at least some cosmic being that created. They believe in nothing. Here we are. It's actually harder to get that. It's easier for the devil to get you coming to church thinking you've punched your ticket to get to heaven, but all the while you're worshiping a Jesus that doesn't exist from the Bible. It's a Jesus that we've created in our own image. It's a lot easier for this devil to get you to do that. You know, John knew how dangerous this was. He writes this incredible letter in 1 John. You should read the whole letter. But right at the end, he says this in verse 20, chapter 5. We know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true. By being in his son, Jesus Christ, he is a true God and eternal life. So John is basically saying here, he's true. This is Jesus. This is Jesus. not a fake Jesus. This is a true, real Jesus. And then he ends the whole, he doesn't even say goodbye. He doesn't even say farewell, love you. This is how he literally, this is his mic drop moment. John ends it and he says this, dear children, keep yourself from idols. That's it. Like that's, that's actually how it is. That's the last thing he says in this, in, in this book, in this letter. That he understands, keep yourself from idols. Because he knows how dangerous idols can become. Jesus is true. Jesus is the son of God. Jesus, he is the only way, the truth, the Jesus of the Bible. He is a Jesus full of love and also judgment. So children, worship that Jesus. Keep yourself away from idols. Keep yourself away from idols that you and I have built. Keep yourself away from idols that we have created in our own image because we want to be nice people, right? Generally, everybody wants to be nice. Do you want to be a nice person? Yeah. So you want your Jesus to be like you. You want your Jesus to be everything that you can't be. 
I want him to be nice. I want him to do this. I want him. And listen, listen to me. Jesus is wonderful. He is perfect. He is amazing. His grace and his mercy. Oh. But Jesus will also judge our sin. But this is how wonderful and beautiful Jesus is, is that he gives us grace and mercy that we don't, we do not deserve. He gives it to us. So the judgment will still come, but the grace and mercy is there. That's how beautiful and wonderful Jesus is. We don't need to water this down. In fact, how beautiful and wonderful, how amazing he is, looks even better because of the fact that he will judge. Because of the fact that there is a judgment day coming. And have we just created a Jesus that allows us to come to church, sing a few songs, feel safe that we're going to heaven, but then on Monday just believe anything we want? Have we created a Jesus that allows us to get into heaven, but maybe with all the cultural stuff going around in the world right now, we, you know, we just won't really get into it. Have we created a Jesus that allows us to go to heaven? but also allows us just to have any sexual identity or sexual preference that we want. Because the Jesus in the Bible is pretty clear on stuff. But the culture of the world has gotten pretty murky on stuff. And a lot of times our minds, because we're oppressed, just like the Jewish people created a savior that they wanted rather than the savior they needed, because they were blinded by their cultural oppression. So many times we are blinded by our cultural oppression that we want a Jesus that allows us to be accepted by the world and still go to heaven. Whereas Jesus is pretty clear, hey, blessed are those who are going to be persecuted for my name's sake. You follow the Jesus of the Bible, you won't be super popular in the world. We talked about this a couple weeks ago in church. You, you follow the Jesus of the Bible, there might be some people that don't like what you have to say. You follow the Jesus of the Bible, not your own Jesus you've made up and, you know, carved a little sign and whacked the name of Jesus. No, no. If you worship the Jesus of the Bible, there will be some things that make your friends angry, just like it made some of the Jewish people 2,000 years ago angry. He went from hero, here comes our Savior, to, oh, he's not what we thought, let's crucify him. What's crazy is, is that Jesus actually was the warrior king that the Jews wanted. But instead of saving them from the Romans, he saved them from their sins. Jesus defeated the power of the devil when he allowed himself to be crucified on that cross. He took all the sin that you and I have committed, and that sin separates us from God. Bible's clear, we've all sinned, it separates us from God. And Jesus, when he allowed himself to be crucified, which we're gonna celebrate this Friday, Good Friday, we've got a presence night at Metro Walk at 5 p.m. We're gonna celebrate and sing and worship and pray. When Jesus allowed himself to be crucified, he took our sin, but on Sunday, oh, Sunday's coming, everybody. Sunday is coming. On Sunday, he rose victorious, and he had the warrior, our warrior king, Jesus, had defeated the power of sin. So much great. Hey, they didn't need Jesus to defeat Rome. Rome defeated itself. Rome, de if you know history, Rome defeated itself. But there was only one person that could defeat the power of sin, the power of death, and that was Jesus. And he did it. He did it. He did it. So my question to you today is this. Is Jesus Messiah? Or is he just a convenient addition to your life when you want him? Is he convenient when you need to pray for something? Is he convenient when we have an anointing service? Is he convenient when I need a job promotion and I'll, and I'll go to him and I'll say hi? Or is he Messiah? Because if he's Messiah, it means that he's Lord, not just Savior. And if he's Lord, it means that he owns everything in your life. It means you can't create your own Jesus. 
It means that you've got to look at the Jesus of the Bible, and you've got to go to it, and you've got to say, who are you, Christ? Could you shape me? Could you mold me? Could you make me more like you, Jesus? Oh, there's some things I might feel uncomfortable about that's written in Scripture, but God, I, I believe in you. I trust you. I know that you're sovereign. Maybe I don't culturally understand it through my cultural lens, but, but in a spiritual lens, God, I understand that you own everything, that you see everything, you understand everything. Even if I can't understand it, God, I know that you understand it, and that's our faith and trust. Is he Messiah or is he convenient? To a lot of those Jews, he was just convenient. And when he stopped being convenient, they walked away. I mean, it didn't just happen then. It happened earlier on in his ministry. John chapter 6, one of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible. I call it the, the Dracula chapter. Because Jesus had thousands of people following him. And then he gets up and he preaches his Dracula sermon. You want to follow me? You must eat my flesh and drink my blood. Right? And if you read it, you know what happened? Many left him. And Jesus turned around to his 12 and he looked at Peter and goes, well, they're all leaving. Are you going to leave too? And Peter got it. Because to the crowd, because the crowd, you always have the crowd. In church, we always have the crowd. To the crowd, Jesus was convenient. And the moment that he got inconvenient, the moment that all of a sudden, wait, I got to eat flesh, I got to drink blood. Wait, what, what? The moment he got inconvenient, they all left. But Peter got it. Jesus looked at him and said, are you going to go? And Peter goes, Lord, where else would we go? Ha, <laughs> Lord. Who else could I serve? Who else could I follow? It's you. I don't know if Peter fully understand drinking the blood and eating the flesh, but he knew that Jesus wasn't just convenient for him. And even though Peter, you know what I love about using Peter as an example? He made mistakes. He cut off an ear. He denied even knowing Jesus in that moment, but he came back and humbled himself. And Peter was one of the great early church fathers. The help spread the gospel. Why? Because Jesus wasn't convenient to him. Jesus was his Messiah. So today, is he your Messiah? Do you have a relationship with Jesus? In a moment, we're going to pray. I'm going to pray for everyone in a moment that feels like maybe they have created their own version of Jesus. Maybe you didn't realize it. And the hard thing about idolatry is that, you know, we, we haven't put up a new statue of Jesus and start, you know, it's it's... What captures your heart? Maybe there's things that you've been worshiping above God in your life, or maybe you just created a, a Jesus that just allows you to do whatever you want with no conviction. And Jesus is just love. Yes, Jesus is love. He is the very definition of love, and it's because he loves you. He also has boundaries. For you. So I'm going to pray for that in a second, but before that, i got to ask you, do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Maybe you're here. Maybe you're watching online. Maybe you've never come to that point where you've acknowledged the sin that separated you. Maybe you've, you've never acknowledged that Jesus is more than just a great historical figure or a great prophet, but that he is the son of God. In his own words, that he is the only way, the truth, and the life, that you cannot get to God through your money, through your good works, even through your knowledge. You can only get to God through Jesus Christ. Acknowledging, Paul writes in Romans chapter 10, that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, not just Savior, but Lord, he owns my whole life. Aha! Then Paul writes, you will be saved. If you're here and you've never done this before, or maybe you did this a long time ago, but you walked away from God, I want to give you a chance to respond. If you're online, I want to give you a chance as well. Can we just bow our heads, close our eyes for a moment? You're saying, James, that's me. I'm that first person. I've never done this. Or you're saying, James, I'm that second person. I did this a long time ago. If that's you, I'd love you on the count of three to lift up your hands because I want to pray for you right where you are. And if you're watching or you're listening on one of our podcasts, you do it because Jesus will see you and that's what matters the most. So if that's you on the count of three, you lift your hands. One, two, three, right now, all over this room. Thank you. I see hands up the back. Thank you, Jesus. Here, hands here. A couple hands on the side here. Thank you, Lord. A couple hands up the back. Hand over here in the middle. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, wonderful Lord. Hey, if you lifted your hand, this is what I want you to do. A hand over there on the side. If you lifted your hand, I want you to put your hand on your heart right now. We're all going to pray this prayer together. But those that lifted their hands, I really want you to mean these words with me. And it's a simple prayer reflecting what the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 10. So come on, why don't we say this together? Say, Dear Lord Jesus, 
come to you right now and I ask you to forgive my sin. I believe that you died on the cross, but you defeated death and you rose victorious. You broke the power of sin. So right now I ask, please come into my life. Be my savior, but be Lord of my whole life. Make me a new creation. Let my heart reflect your heart. In your beautiful name I pray. Amen. Amen. Can we give God praise for every person that just prayed that prayer? If you're in the room and you lifted your hand, one of our team would have seen you at the end of the service. They're just going to come and say hi to you and we want to explain to you the decision that you've just made and really help you in the journey, in your next steps and what it means to really follow Jesus. And we just think that Jesus is wonderful and a life with him changes everything. Amen? Amen. Three people agree with me. Amen? Amen. Come on. Can we all stand for a moment? I believe that the presence of God is here and he wants to minister right now with people. Maybe you're here today And maybe as I was speaking, the Holy Spirit just began to put a conviction on your heart. I I can't go through a whole list of things. God, God and you know it much better than me trying to list out a list of things. But you know, maybe you've been putting things above Jesus in your life. Maybe it's been your job, your career. Maybe you've been worshiping that more than you've been worshiping Jesus. Maybe you've created a false Jesus, a Jesus that is okay with sin, a Jesus that doesn't judge, a Jesus that's just loose on everything. And and he says, and and today you have felt the conviction of your heart to to be drawn back to the Word of God, to get into the Gospels, to see who Jesus is, to to get into the epistles in the Bible, to read the letters of those who'd either walked with Jesus or had close revelation of who he is. I, I don't know where you're at, but I know God is speaking people. If that's you, could you just lift your hands to heaven right now all over this place? Because I want to pray for you. Thank you. You know, whenever I have these moments in me, I want to let you know that I'm lifting my hands right now, not because I'm created some wildly false God, but I know that there's aspects sometimes in me where maybe I want Jesus to be something that he's not, and it puts disappointment in me. And I'm lifting my hands to say, God, I'm sorry for those moments, that who you are is actually enough. I don't need you to be something that you're not, Jesus. Who you are is actually enough for me. So God, I pray with every hand raised right now, Lord, those that need to repent right now, come on, just in your own words, if you need to repent, you say, Jesus, I'm sorry for worshiping something else more than you. Jesus, I'm sorry for having idols in my life that I've put above you. Maybe for those that have created your own Jesus, Jesus, I'm sorry for creating my own version of you. For those that have been hurt, maybe you're here and you still have hurt and pain because you're upset that Jesus didn't answer the prayer the way you expected, that you were expecting him to be this earthly king, but he didn't do it the way you wanted him to do it. and so. You've got bitterness there. You've got anger. Come on, just right now, come before him. Apologize, repent. God, I'm sorry. God, I'm sorry for having false ideas of you. God, I'm sorry for thinking the wrong thing of you. God, I'm sorry for creating a a Jesus that just does not exist. And I come back right now. God, bring us back to who you are. Bring us back to the truth of who you are. You are beautiful, Jesus. You are wonderful. You are full of grace. Oh, you are full of mercy. But as well, you are full of truth. You are full of wisdom. You've given us great boundaries to live by, to protect us. Oh, we love you, Jesus. God, bring us back, correct us. Align us to who you are, Jesus. Align us to who you are, Jesus. Align us to who you are, Jesus. Oh, I pray, Jesus, that you would reign in this church. That it would be you and you alone who reigns in this church. That you alone would get the glory. You alone would get the praise. If 
people 2,000 years ago crowded the streets. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Even though I'm sure some of them turned in a week, they may not have known how prophetic they were being. Oh, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he that comes. He is not just coming in the name of the Lord, he is the Lord. Today, come on, on Palm Sunday, I want us to realign, to correct if we've been off, and I want us to come back to who Jesus is, and I want us to lift the name of Jesus in this place, to sing and to worship him. Come on, from the front to the back, can you lift your hands? Can you sing it with us together? We're going to lift it up. Hosanna. We sing Hosanna, Hosanna.
sing it again, all praise. All praise, all praise to the name above all names. Jesus, you reign, you're the name above all names. So this is my challenge to you. We've just literally done what they did 2,000 years ago. We have lifted up Jesus. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. We've put our coats on the ground, not physically, but metaphorically, we've put our coats, King Jesus. Jesus is the king of this church. He's the king of this church, Jesus. We love so here's my challenge, here's my challenge. In the next week, don't crucify him. Don't crucify him if he doesn't meet your expectation. Sorry, could I say that again? Don't crucify him if he doesn't meet your false expectation of who he is. Don't crucify him again. He's already been crucified once. He doesn't need it again. Come in line. Jesus, even if I don't fully understand everything, I'm not going to lean on my own understanding. But in everything I do, in all my ways, I'm going to acknowledge that you alone are sovereign, that you alone are good. I trust in you. And as I trust in you, my heart is going to beat like yours. I'm going to desire what you desire, and you are going to make my paths straight. That was the longest retelling of Proverbs. I added a few extra bits in there. Don't crucify him again. Don't let Jesus become convenient in your life. Let him be the Messiah that rules your whole life. Amen? Amen. Next weekend, let me tell you, next weekend, it's going to be wonderful. I know different people will go away on uh, Holy Week, and if you do, please, please be safe. Travel safe. We're going to be online. Are, are we showing uh, Presence Night online or not? Do we say? We are. This time, we are. At 5 p.m., we're putting Presence Light online. Usually we don't because we want you to be in the room, but we understand people are traveling a lot of Easter, and it's a wonderful way that maybe you can int introduce your family. Some of you in the province, hey, do you want to come and watch this? So 5 p.m. this Friday at Metro Tent in the Metro Walk. If you don't know where that are, it's where a whole bunch of bars and CD nightclubs and everything are. Uh, but we're going to bring the name of Jesus into that place. It's a, it's a big old tent. I grew up having tent revivals in Las Pinas down south with Pastor Chat. Remember the big old tent we used to have? So we're just doing it again. It's everything comes back. So Friday, next Sunday, we're going to have Easter Sunday. We're going to be baptizing people in our two services. Uh, it's just going to be a wonderful day to invite people. We have space. At the Metro Tent, we have space. So I want to encourage you, invite people to come along. We are going to celebrate our risen King. Our theme is Sunday's coming. And the reason why is because we know when Sunday comes, we have victory. When Sunday comes, there's breakthrough. When Sunday comes, there's healing. Oh, when Sunday comes, that's when we understand that Jesus is alive. He's broken the power of sin and death. Woo! Oh, it's going to be a good, 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 good day. So next weekend, Easter is going to be wonderful. But it's not here. Everyone say, it's not here. If you come next week and you come to Crown and we're not here, don't get angry at me, huh? I told you, it's not here. It's at the Metro Tent and there's plenty of parking for everyone there as well. Wonderful. God is good. Amen? Amen. 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 Take your seats just for one second. I got a couple of things that I want to share with you and then we're going to release and we're going to go. If you grabbed our new people's bags today, thank you so much for coming to church. We'd love to connect with you out in our foyer. We've got a whole team out here that's waiting to get to meet you, get to know you, hear a little bit about your story, how you ended up here at church. If you don't have time to do that today, but you want to get more connected into our house, learn a little bit more about our church, you can just fill out that black form in your bag, hand it to one of our team or put it in the box and we'll take that from you. I got four things that I need to tell you and they're going to be up on the screen. I already told you this Friday night, 5 p.m. Our doors open at 4 p.m. If you want to get there early, it'll be aircon. So you can come in. It's going to be wild. 
uh, there's not going to be many chairs out. We stand a lot. So if you, if you really want to sit, you can either bring your own little stool if you want, but we will have chairs for PWD and for some of our seasoned people as well. And then obviously next Sunday, sign up for baptism if you haven't signed up before. If you're planning on getting married, we want to encourage you to do our course before forever. You need to sign up for that. It's going to be over two Saturdays, April 13 and 20. And then obviously we have favor conference, which is going to be good. Amen. Amen. The Lord is good. Melba, why don't you come on up here and you can pray. Everyone who here wants a week of favor and blessing. Come on. You're going to be blessed. Israel's about to be blessed. Come on, Melba, pray for us. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, we honor you and we thank you, God, for this beautiful day, oh Lord. Thank you for the word that you have spoken into our, into our hearts, into our spirit, oh God. Thank you for, for what you have done in the cross. Thank you because of you, we are all here. And as we go, oh God, may we, may we carry the blessings and the favor that you have, you have given to us, oh God. May we spread it, Lord, in our family, God, in the place we're going to be, oh Lord, this week, oh God, in our businesses, in school, in our offices, oh God, at the workplace, wherever you are. Lord, allow us to operate, Lord, under the power of your presence and your and your glory, oh God, and the power and the authority and the anointing of Jesus Christ. And everybody says, Amen.